What's up guys? So it's time for week four's top waiver wire targets and I'm gonna break it down by position and give you guys a couple of players from each position. So starting with the quarterbacks first, my top guy is gonna be Sam Darnold. I just really love seeing what's going on with Darnold in Carolina right now. Um, it's just yet again goes to show just how horrible of a coach Adam Gase is. And now that Darnold is free from that, he's, uh, he's looking like a whole new player in this system in Carolina. Coming into the year, I liked Darnold a lot as like a guy who would probably surprise a lot of people and probably end up in like the low QB1, high end QB2 range. And that's through three weeks. That's exactly where he is right now. He's quarterback 11 on the year. And more than that, what's crazy is that he's being really consistent and playing really clean football. Across the three seasons he played in New York, he only hit 67% completion rate or greater 10 times. Um, all three of his games so far with the Panthers, he's done that. And he's put up 300 yards or more twice, and the other game it was like 280. So he's putting up a solid number of yards. Even though he only has six total touchdowns, he's playing really clean, like I said. Um, he only has one interception, and it was not his fault. It was on a really fluky play where he was trying to shovel pass and his arm got hit and then a defensive lineman who was being blocked it just landed right in his stomach and that's his only pick so far matt rule has a system designed pretty perfectly for darnold and now we're seeing why they went out and got him in free agency because all darnold really has to do is just facilitate and not try to do anything over his head not try to play hero ball um, this is not a situation like new york where it's just you know kind of a wasteland around him here he has a really good supporting cast in terms of the players really good supporting cast in terms of the coaching and the game planning and the pieces around him all he has to do is pretty much just get the ball to them and then they're going to do it which brings me to christian mccaffrey being out obviously that hurts the efficiency that this offense is going to see but i don't think it's that bad for darnold if anything it's going to lead him to run through the air a little bit more I would definitely rather have McCaffrey, but if you're looking to stream Darnold in week four, he has a great matchup regardless of who his running back is. He gets to play the Cowboys. And I just think that's just a solid streaming option right now. Now, speaking of playing solid, consistent, clean football, Kirk Cousins is quietly having an awesome season so far. He's on pace right now. I know it's early in the season, but he is on pace to set career highs in yards, touchdown passes, completion percentage, uh, quarterback rating, and he hasn't even turned over the ball yet once. He's the QB five right now in fantasy, and he's done that exclusively through the air. He only has 37 total yards on the ground and no rushing touchdowns to help boost him up. This has just been through his arm. This Viking offense has just been humming, and what's crazy is they're doing it with not even being at full strength. Obviously, they already lost Irv Smith for the season, and this past week without Devin Cook, what's really encouraging for me is that Without Cook, Kirk went out and had one of his best, most efficient games ever. He threw for over 300 yards on, I believe, 30 for 38 passing and three scores. And again, no, no turnovers. Out of all quarterbacks who have at least as many passing attempts as Kirk, Kirk is the one that has the highest completion percentage and the highest quarterback rating. Even if you don't account for the number of attempts and you just let everybody be ranked, Kirk is still fourth in those rankings. The passing game really doesn't need to do much more than funnel targets to Thielen and Jefferson and occasionally to the running back, but the emergence of KJ Osborne out of the slot and really a nice surprise in Tyler Conklin being great as the tight end, it's just making things easier than ever for Kirk. Now, a big part of that is that the offense is doing a great job of staying on track. They're running the ball really well and Kirk is being sacked right now at the lowest rate of his entire career. Now, it's hard to say which one of those is causing the other. You know, is it because he's not being sacked that he's allowed to be so efficient? Or is it because he's being so efficient that he's not being sacked? But either way, the sacks are not happening. The offense is staying on schedule really well. And I'll, I think it could be a little bit of a bumpy road in terms of sacks and staying on schedule this week coming up against Cleveland, who just absolutely victimized the Chicago Bears offensive line. Um, looking ahead, there's some really good matchups for the Vikings coming up after this week. So if you can afford to pick up Kirk maybe as your second quarterback or deal with streaming him this week as well, you get to play against the Lions and the Cowboys coming up soon. And I just think that he's going to have another couple of great games coming up here. So moving on from quarterbacks, let's go look at the running backs who are almost always the most important guys on the waivers. And this week, the top priority, if he's on your waiver, it's got to be Chuba Hubbard. Now, there's a good chance that he got drafted in your league, especially by the C-Mac owner. Um, but you never know with leagues, you know, early in the season, sometimes people can fall victim to the shallow benches and they have to drop guys that they would otherwise 
always be keeping. And if Hubbard is available in your league, you should go after him as your top priority. And if you're talking fab, you should probably go after him pretty hard because I know they haven't put McCaffrey on the IR yet, but it's a hamstring injury to a guy who's coming off of a major injury. I just don't see them working him back into the offense. Definitely not this week coming up, probably not the next week after that. And maybe in week six, he, he's active, but I really doubt that he is going to be getting anywhere close to his full workload. And speaking of his full workload, C-Mac has so far been seeing 30 touches per game on this offense. Considering that Hubbard was already getting a few touches here and there with C-Mac getting that workload, he stands to absorb a lot of that usage and his value just shot up. Now, obviously he's nowhere near as dynamic, nowhere near as talented as C-Mac, but I will say he's way more dynamic, way more talented than his backfield mate, Royce Freeman who didn't get any touches uh, in the first two weeks, and he got like, I believe 10 snaps in week three once C-Mac went down. So this is this is Hubbard. You, you want Hubbard out of this backfield. I don't really think Freeman is very relevant at all. And like I already said, C-Mac is projected to come back pretty soon, but even when he does, Hubbard is a guy that you're gonna want to obviously keep um, and maybe look to trade him now while his value is at its most unknown and highest because of that unknown. Um, if the if you're the CMAC owner and you also have Hubbard, obviously you're not looking to move him, but maybe pitch an offer to the CMAC owner and see if he can pay up a little bit for this guy. I wouldn't be looking to just get rid of Hubbard for whatever I can get for him right now, but I will say that with the way hamstring injuries go, uh, CMAC could come back and be active in games, which would make you not confident enough in Hubbard to start him but C-Mac might not be 100% the rest of the year. And for all we know, this could be another one of those long, drawn out, really frustrating situations where as long as both guys are active, you don't feel great about either one. So right now, while Hubbard is the guy, maybe try and sell high on that value. So I got this sleeper alert um, from John Gruden talking about how great Peyton Barber looked in, what did he, he quoted him as like two teams ago and I just kind of laughed it off and was like, eh, Gruden, yeah, he loves his grinders or whatever, but I didn't take it seriously. And I definitely should have because while Barber, you know, was assumed to be worth picking up and maybe stashing on your bench, I don't think too many people were starting him. A lot of people were leaning towards Kenyon Drake because Drake was involved in the passing game. But Barber came out and got a huge workload in week three. He got 23 carries, five targets, and he ended up putting, I believe, close to 140 total yards in a score. Now in week two, Kenyon Drake had, this is with Josh Jacobs already out, Kenyon Drake had dominated the snap count between himself and Barber. He had gotten 71% of the snaps while Barber only saw 19, but Kenyon was a little bit more appealing because he had gotten seven carries, six targets, whereas Barber got zero targets. It was all carries. Um, what's crazy is that with Barber getting this expanded role, Kenyon's Drake role stayed exactly the same. So it seems to me now that they don't really care whether it's going to be Josh Jacobs, whether it's going to be Peyton Barber, whether they're going to go sign Frank Gore, whoever their pounder is going to be, they're going to be the one that gets the role if Josh Jacobs goes down, if Ken, or Peyton Barber goes down. Kenyon Drake is always going to be relegated to this a couple carries and mostly targets role. Now, with that being said, Peyton Barber is going to be the guy here, most likely in week four as well, because Josh Jacobs hasn't been able to log even a limited practice, even one time since he got injured in week one. So it's a Monday night game. It's kind of sketchy. It might get sketchy as we get closer to that Monday night if we start hearing things about Josh Jacobs practicing. But I would say for right now, Barber is most likely going to start in week four. If he does get the start in week four and you can feel confident that he's going to play, that's going to be a huge, huge opportunity for Barber to pop off again because they're playing the Chargers and the Chargers have allowed the most rushing yards across the first three games in the entire league. This is a division matchup, like I said, on primetime, Monday Night Football. You know Gruden loves that smash mouth, hard running football. He's going to feature his power back in this game. So if what I've said about Kenyon Drake's role being kind of fixed here, no matter what happens to the other guys, if that holds true in week three, I think you hold Peyton Barber the rest of the season because if Josh Jacobs were to get banged up again and he's not exactly, you know, a beacon of health here, um, we would be pretty safe to assume that Barber would be getting a full workload again. So my next guy is pretty much only going to be appealing to people who are in deeper PPR leagues, but it's Giovanni Bernard. I definitely wouldn't feel good about starting him even in these deeper PPR leagues right now, but he's a pretty interesting pickup. 
He's coming off a game where he saw by far his highest snap count of the season, and he also saw 10 targets, which for the entirety of Brady's time with the Bucks, all of 2020 and so far in 2021, that's the most that any running back has ever seen in one game. Now, on one hand, that's really encouraging for Gio because from what we heard in the offseason, Brady recruited him for the purpose of being his new, you know, James White pass catching specialist back. But on the other hand, he's through three games still hasn't logged a single carry. So if we don't see game scripts where it makes sense to have Gio heavily involved, he's going to be pretty sparingly involved. Uh, they're still going to use him in the two minute drills. They're most likely going to use him in red zone passing downs. But other than that, he's pretty much just a specialist. His high usage in week three was most likely just a result of the Bucks trailing for almost the entire game, except for like a few minutes in the first quarter where the game was tied. And five out of his 10 targets came late in the fourth quarter when the Bucks were down by 17 points. Obviously, none of us think that's gonna happen too many times the rest of the season. The Bucks are not gonna be trailing by 17 points late in the fourth. So I don't really expect these kind of games to happen for Gio that much, but for all we know, it's just taking him this long to get worked into the offense with Brady. Speaking of Brady, he's picking up right where he left off with the Bucks last year. He's leading all quarterbacks in pass attempts, where last season he finished uh, second behind, I believe, Matt Ryan only in pass attempts. And he, that kind of a connection that he had with James White back in New England, if he develops that with Gio Bernard, combining that with just how pass heavy he is at this point of his career on this team, that's all you really need for a guy in a PPR league, in especially a deeper league. A guy like Gio could have huge flex value just based on that kind of a special favoritism from Brady. Now, I don't think the current volume that Brady is on pace to put up through his entire season, it just can't hold up. I mean, I, it could possibly, it is Brady, but right now he's on pace to throw like 800 pass attempts, which would shatter the NFL record. So that's gotta come down, I would assume. But even if it does a bit, he's still probably going to lead the league or come close to leading the league in pass attempts. And like I said, that special connection, that's all you really need for a guy in a PPR league. So would I start Geo this week? Almost definitely not, unless I was super desperate in like a 16 team. But do I think he's worth a pickup? For sure. So moving over to the wide receivers now and Josh Gordon. Flash Gordon is back, and now we know why Andy Reid was hospitalized, because he probably got the alert before we did. No, in all seriousness, um, Josh Gordon is back, and fantasy football is supposed to be about fun, right? And what's more fun than picking up Josh Gordon halfway through the season and putting him on your bench and maybe getting that monster blow-up game before he gets suspended indefinitely again for weed or pills or whatever he's doing these days? I mean, we all know the guy's resume. He's just an absolute freak. Probably one of the most athletic guys to ever play in the league. Just uh, ridiculous, ridiculous talent. And now he's coming to the Chiefs offense, which, let's be real here, even if he pushes past everybody on the wide receiver core besides Tyreek, he's still the third option in the passing game at best because Kelsey is number one. Sometimes Kelsey's number one and number two. And then Tyreek is the top guy out of the wide receivers. You get a bunch of weirdness, you know, creative play designs that I would say count as the number third option where you don't know where Andy Reid has a play scheme up to go to. It might be going to a second string tight end or a third string tight end or a fullback or an offensive lineman, but it is exciting. I mean, the guy has ridiculous talent. It's been a while since he's been in the league. This is, we say this every time, this is his last chance, but I find it hard to believe that he's going to have too many more chances than this. And I don't just mean the suspensions thing. I mean, he needs to prove that he's worth the headache and the PR headache that comes with bringing a guy like him in. He needs to prove that he still has it, has the ability to do something in the league. And if he can't do it here, I know we said this with the Patriots, but I truly believe that if he can't do it here in this offense, he can't do it. So this is probably his last stop and why not, you know, last dance, screw it, let's ride. Now going back to a guy who's actually caught a pass this calendar year, um, Hunter Renfro with the Raiders. He's actually playing a really valuable role in an offense that's looking really great right now. I just talked about Tom Brady leading the league in pass attempts. Well, Derek Carr is right behind him knocking on the door and Carr is leading all quarterbacks in passing yards. So somebody besides Darren Waller has to catch some of those attempts, has to catch some of those yards. 
And um, actually, what's weird because after that ridiculous 19 target week one to Darren Waller, Waller only saw, I believe, seven targets in both of his next two games, which is basically what Renfro saw, what Rugg saw, and Renfro is playing almost exclusively out of the slot. And he's mainly served as a shorter route runner who's been getting a lot of yards after the catch. So the way this offense is schemed up with the really strong running game and the fact that Waller just commands so much attention, plus Ruggs commands so much uh, defensive uh, accountability, you know, they have to play that safety over the top or else you're just going to give up bombs every play. It leaves a lot of open space for Renfro, and he's actually, despite running a lot of shorter routes, he's averaging a pretty respectable 12.8 yards per reception, which among guys who have as many targets or catches as Renfro, that's 12th in the entire league. So with just how potent this offense is right now, I don't see anything really changing. Renfro is still going to get a bunch of targets, and defenses are still going to have to scheme to try to take Waller out of the equation, try to keep Ruggs from beating them on every play, and it's going to leave a lot of space for Renfro to keep doing what he's been doing. So in PPR leagues especially, I think he's absolutely worth the pickup. So my next waiver target in terms of the wide receivers, it's... It's a little bit of a cheat here because I'm just going to go with the Patriots wide receivers. And by them, I mean Kendrick Bourne and Nelson Aguilar. And it kind of just depends on what you're looking for out of that position right now. Because it's easy to chase the production of Bourne that we just saw. Um, and it's easy to be down on Aguilar with the fact that he hauled in, I think, just two of his eight targets. But I do think that Aguilar over the course of the entire season will end up being the more valuable guy. But right now, if you're looking for someone that you need to plug and play, especially in a deeper league, a PPR league, I think you should go with Kendrick Bourne. So just to break it down real quick, Jacoby Myers is the unquestioned lead receiver on the team. He plays a ton of snaps, like 94% of snaps or something, and it's almost always in the slot. Um, Nelson Aguilar is the primary outside wide receiver. He plays like 85% of all the snaps, and they're almost always out of the outside the numbers. Um, Kendrick Bourne does a mixture of both, but he plays a pretty decent amount in the slot. Because of that, I think that Bourne is more likely to be getting fed a few more targets right now, because if we look at what just happened, Mac Jones just threw the first interceptions of his career. He threw three of them all in the same game, and I would not be surprised if the Patriots in week four kind of returned to a bit of more of a conservative passing attack. And I think Mac Jones will be a little bit gun shy to be trying to push the ball downfield to Aguilar right now. They're going to be playing against the Tampa Bay defense. And yes, you do want to pick on the passing defense as opposed to the run defense. But that's not to say that passing defense is any kind of slouch. They're still pretty good and they're going to make a rookie quarterback make some mistakes and they're going to capitalize on those mistakes. So if Belichick is smart, I think we're going to see Mac Jones kind of just be a bit more conservative with it than he was against the Saints. Now that would favor Bourne because Bourne is, his average depth of target is literally half that of what Aguilar's is. Aguilar's is around 10.4, whereas Bourne's is like 5.2. So Bourne is running shorter routes, a lot more routes out of the slot, and they're easier routes to complete. I also should mention that James White got injured in week three, and I don't think it's a coincidence that we saw Bourne get his highest usage of the season, most targets, uh, I believe highest snap rate as well, in the game where James White went down. That's going to vacate about seven targets per game that he was getting so far in the year, and while uh, Brandon Bolden is definitely going to be the one that mainly sees his value boost because of that, uh, it's definitely not a bad thing for Bourne. Also, looking at the week four matchup, I expect Carlton Davis to be on Jacoby Myers and Ross Cockrell to be on Nelson Aguilar or vice versa. It really doesn't matter, but I expect those two to be matched up against those two. And that leaves Kendrick Bourne to be covered by most likely Jamel Dean. If he can even play, he hurt his knee in week three. And if he can't go, it's going to be backup cornerback D Delaney. I had to look that up real quick. So I definitely like Bourne's odds to have a solid game in PPR especially. But like I said, over the rest of the season, as Mac Jones works through these jitters, works through these bumps in his rookie year, I think that we're going to see Aguilar's role as the outside wide receiver pay off more and more. And I think when we look back on the season, Aguilar will be the more valuable receiver. But right now for the next matchup and looking ahead at the next few weeks, I would rather have Bourne. After week four against the Bucks, the Patriots get to play the Texans, the Cowboys, and the Jets. And I think they're going to beat up on all three of those secondaries. 
Now my final wide receiver pickup is a guy that I'm really not excited about at all. I would not want to start him, um, definitely only for deeper leagues, but I feel like I kind of have to mention it because he's available everywhere and what he just saw come his way in week three, you can't just ignore it. So it's Khalif Raymond from the Lions. Now, like I said, I'm not excited about this. I'm not a fan of the third or maybe even fourth option in a Jared Goff led passing attack. Because if you look at this offense, it's very much centered around this passing offense, I should say. It's very much centered around throwing to the tight end, throwing to the running backs. And even with Tyrell Williams out, I'm just not too excited about any of the Lions wide receivers right now. So despite leading all of Lions receivers in snaps, targets, catches, yards, he still trails TJ Hawkinson and DeAndre Swift in all those categories, every single one. And he's neck and neck with running back Jamal Williams with those categories as well even though Jamal Williams is playing way less snaps than Raymond. That's just how uninvolved the wide receivers are for this team. It's the main reason why I didn't really care about Quintez Cephas in the past week's waivers, because his production was pretty much completely touchdown dependent. The volume just wasn't there. And you had to know that eventually the touchdowns weren't gonna be there. And I wasn't expecting him to get one target in week three, but that just goes to show you. However, Raymond did get 10 targets. You can't just ignore that, especially in deep PPR leagues where he's definitely gonna be on your waiver wire. 10 targets is the most we've seen for any Lions receiver so far this year, and he's starting to pull ahead of the other receivers in terms of his snap totals. So in deep leagues, I definitely think he's worth checking out, picking up, stashing him, start him at your own risk anytime soon. But for what it's worth, he does get decent matchups coming up against the Bears, the Vikings, and the Bengals. So that's it for the wide receivers. Moving over to the tight ends, my first guy, this one's gonna be kind of gross for some of you, it's Mike Gesicki. Now I know that's hard to stomach for a lot of people, me, me included, because Gesicki, he just seems to drop the goose egg right at the most unexpected and most inopportune times. Like you expect him, you're like, okay, everything is pointing to him being involved this week and he goes out and it's like one for eight or he drops his only target. However, this time around, things are a bit different because Tua is out for the time being. Um, I believe he just got put on IR, so he's going to be out for at least the next three weeks with, if I remember right, it was a bruised ribs or some kind of rib cartilage. So Jacoby Brissett is in. And through two games with Brissett, Gesicki has seen 18 targets, which has shot him all the way up to near the top of the tight end rankings, which just shows you the state of the position. He's already all the way up just behind uh, Waller, Kelsey, and Hawkinson. And then there's Kasicki. He almost led all receivers in week three with targets. He had 12 and Waddle had 13. Um, and he's really not even a tight end. Like he's a tight end in name only because if you've ever seen this guy play, you know, he's just one of the most freakishly athletic guys at the position right now. And they use him as basically just a wide receiver. Like he finished last season with, uh, I believe the fourth or fifth highest um, route rate on passing plays for the Dolphins. So he ran a route on passing plays 96% of the time, maybe 96.4. It was actually 96.2. And that trend is continuing again this season. Um, on passing plays that he's in, he's running around almost 100% of the time. Now with tight ends, it's really simple. If we're not talking about one of the top guys, you have to look at volume. If the volume's there, they're worth starting and you just have to deal with what happens. Um, if they don't have the volume, they're just one of a, a bunch of guys who are in this weird murky pool where everybody has some degree of scoring upside and that's what you're hoping for. Um, Gesicki, with how freakishly talented he is, he's always had that scoring upside, but right now with Brissett, he might have the volume too. So go grab him. The Dolphins get to play the Colts in week four, which might have been a scary matchup last season, but so far this season, it's been anything but. Uh, the defense has been giving up 27 points per game so far. And looking ahead past that, the Dolphins get to play the Jaguars, the Falcons, and the Texans coming up soon. And the other tight end pickup I have, and the final player on my list, is Tyler Conklin with the Vikings. So I talked about Kirk Cousins balling out earlier, and right now Conklin is one of the main beneficiaries of that. With Irv Smith out for the year and Kyle Rudolph over in New York now, Conklin is the only tight end in Minnesota that has really any kind of pass catching ability. And I don't want to hear about Chris Herndon. Stop. Considering that the tight end tandem of Smith and Rudolph combined for 80 targets last season and the year before that they combined for 95 targets 
there's work on the table for where Conklin to potentially get. And he started to see that in week three, getting eight targets. He caught seven of those eight targets, and one of them was a really nice short out route, but it was a design play for him in the red zone. I believe it was from the seven yard line about, where the defense was, first of all, it was a two tight end set. And with the way the Vikings run the ball, the defense just has to commit to stopping that. And secondly, Adam Thielen was running a kind of a double move comeback route, and Seattle had to send two guys over that direction to make sure they were covering that. And Kirk's first read was Conklin the whole way, and it was just a free touchdown. He also almost scored on another pass in the red zone where they actually lined Conklin out far outside the numbers, and he ran a slant route, showed some really nice bursts to take it about 16 yards down to the two-yard line where he got tackled. So this could have been an even bigger day for Conklin. That kind of scoring opportunity is going to be there all season for Conklin because Jefferson and Thielen, they follow so many targets, they also attract so much defensive attention, and you can't even really sell out to stop the pass at all, or you're going to get gashed by the run. Speaking of the run, Conklin does do a good amount of run blocking, but he still maintains a really good route rate, meaning when they do end up having Conklin in on passing plays, he's running a route on a good amount of those. So given that flexibility in the way the Vikings can use him, I expect Conklin to be on the field a ton and see a pretty good amount of work going forward. I think what we saw in week one and two, where he got about four targets each game, that's probably his baseline, his floor. And like I said with Kirk, even though it might be a bit bumpy with the Browns coming up, the next three games after that, he gets the Lions, the Panthers, and the Cowboys. So I would be very much okay with starting him in those matchups. All right, that's everybody on my list for this week. If you want to check out my in-depth write-ups that I've had for each one of these players, you can check out my Reddit post. I will link it there. And it has links to my Everyplay videos, or since you're already on YouTube, you can go check out on my channel the Everyplay videos for every one of these guys, except the quarterbacks. Um, it'll show you every single target, every single play, even if it was called back due to penalty. So you can check out and get a look for yourself and see what these guys did that made me think they are worth picking up. All right, that's going to do it for this video. I will see you guys later this week with my next analysis video, and I will see you in the next one.